All right, everyone, welcome back to Talking Soccer. I'm your host, Justin Forniker. Today, we're going to go over the big first matchups from Group E and Group F, our first look at some big names of this tournament. And with upsets on our mind lately, we've got another little upset here today. Although, once you think about it, maybe isn't as big of an upset as say Argentina losing to Saudi Arabia but first game we can talk about today is Germany losing to Japan 1-2 to two. and this is just a classic case of Germany not being able to finish their chances if you look at the run of play Germany for the most part won this game on the amount of possession they have on the amount of just how much they dictated the run of play having 75% of possession winning the XG battle 3.09 to one and a half. The difference being that Japan were able to take advantage of Germany's frustration. They go up one nothing. They aren't able to finish Japan off. And even though the if you look at the accurate passes, Germany's accurate passes are 686 to Japan's 190. Not the uh, most lopsided passing numbers of the day, but we'll get to that later. You would think, you know, looking at all this, that Germany would have run over Japan. If you look at the big chances, Germany had five big chances to Japan's three. The difference being that Japan was clinical in those finishes. If you look at the second goal, it's a goal scorer's goal that Germany just didn't have in this game. Definitely missing Mukoko. I don't know why they don't start him. They don't play him until the 90th minute, I should say, especially given you know how Kai Havertz has looked just forever. Uh, but of course, the... First goal from Japan coming in the 75th minute from Ritsu Doen, and then Takuma Asano in the 83rd minute. And that's the one where he beats all the German defenders back and is able to put it near post high on Manuel Neuer after he gets his near post low. And just kind of like one of those impossible angle goals that in the World Cup, I think you just have those games where a team can come out with their identity. Japan has dangerous speed they knew that if they sat back they could get Germany on the counter and that's kind of their chance to win it's a well-drilled team too outside of the penalty that Gonda gave up in the 10th minute Ilke Gundogan that of course Gundogan is able to convert relatively easily it's looking in the 10th minute like this is Germany's game they're gonna run away with this one but like I said Germany can't put Japan away. Now Japan are sticking in this game. There's a Kaya Vert's goal ruled offside in the 49th minute. Going into halftime, up 1-0, and Japan come into the second half making some crucial adjustments. Bringing in Tomiyasu, Mitoma, and Asano. Asano who'd go on to score the clinching goal. And I think it's that speed and understanding of their general goal of this game. They understand what they're trying to accomplish. They understand that while they might not be more talented than Germany from a top to bottom perspective, they know what their identity is, and they know that they can lure Germany into pressing everyone forward. They can lure Germany into getting frustrated. They don't have a clinical clinical attacker on the field, and they can hit them on the counter with that burst of speed that they have down the flank. And we'll see that in the Canada-Belgium game earlier. I think that's an area where these teams can exploit some of the favorites because they are well-structured in the interior, but down the flanks, they are vulnerable. Japan lead this one with three points. Germany, once again, have lost their World Cup opener and a lot of questions to be asked. Germany thought that they maybe had, you know, fixed the soup by bringing on Hansi Flick, but it's more of the same for them as far as those frustrations they've been having for the last four years. Moving on to the next game, so, of course, we also have in Group E, Spain and Costa Rica. Group E, all about just those completed passes. This is what makes Group E interesting now. So, Japan go up. They score three points. Germany leaving pointless. But it's not going to be easy for them. Spain versus Costa Rica. Spain wins 7 to nothing. Here are the goals. Olmo in the 11th minute, Asensio in the 21st. And this Asensio goal is great too because he's kind of coming in a late arriving run just completely unmarked in the box, which we can talk about Costa Rica's defending today all we want. If you've watched enough of them during CONCACAF, you've seen it before. 
Although in CONCACAF and, you know, leading up to this point, they've had Kaylor Neves there to bail them out. Nothing that Neves could do on a lot of these. Really done dirty. I might give him a 2.4 rating, but I don't think you can really blame Navas for this. Uh, Spain had 974 completed passes in this game, and that's not the goalkeeper's fault. So, like I said, goals from Olmo, Asensio, Torres in the 31st minute, 31st minute completing a penalty. In the 54th minute as well, uh, Gavi in the 74th minute, Morata in the 90th minute, and Carlos Soler in the 90th minute as well. Just a complete stomping of Costa Rica from Spain. Kind of one of the most dominating performances you'll see in this World Cup. Jordi Alba was just fantastic down the left side of this game. And honestly, like, Left side, right side, down the middle. Spain just dominated. They were able to control the ball. They were able to possess the ball. And like I said, those passing numbers, 978 completed passes. 94% of their passes were complete. That's just a team passing you to death, cut by 1,000 passes. Almost 1,000 passes. Uh, Spain had 82% of the possession. 17 shots, 5 big passes, 3.53 expected goals to Costa Rica, 0 shots. That's just complete domination of a game there's not much more you can say to really diagnose this Costa Rica are obviously in trouble I think you know no one was really expecting them to do much in this group anyway but after a performance like this it's equally noticeable Japan have a chance to grab another three points from Costa Rica next week and Spain has to play Germany so Germany are in trouble. They could potentially be going into that final game against Costa Rica already being eliminated from the group stage. And that's something that puts a lot of pressure on that Spain game with how they played today, with how they just were able to completely dominate their game plan. Now, both Spain and Germany will try to possess the ball. They'll try to pass the ball. They'll try to dominate down the middle. And while Jordi Alba had just a fantastic game against Costa Rica, against Germany, you're not going to have that much time and space. You're not going to be able to uh, just completely undress the defense like you were against Costa Rica. So I'm expecting a bit of a bounce back from Germany. I'm expecting not as easy of a game for Spain. And if Germany want to advance out of this group, they need to at least pick up points, ideally pick up this win against Spain going forward. But... Let's move away from Group E and let's move on to Group F. Let's talk about the uh, more boring game of Group F. Another 0-0 tie between Morocco and Croatia. One of those games where both teams are kind of feeling themselves out. It's you know one of those chess match games where both teams line up in a 4-3-3. Neither team can do much attacking-wise. If you look at the general stats, while Croatia had 65% of the possession... To, to Morocco's 35%. Croatia weren't really able to create much, but neither were Morocco. Croatia had one big chance in this game. Morocco had zero. Morocco had eight shots on goal. Croatia had five. It's just one of those games where, you know, both teams, I think, did a great job of neutralizing each other. Croatia had a lot of possession, completed double the passes that Morocco did. But Morocco did a great job in their game plan of sitting back, letting Croatia have possession, and Croatia, their attackers between Kramaric, Vlasic, Perisic weren't able to make any noise at all, really. And then you have Hakimi playing just a fantastic game for Morocco. Your big names like Ziyech aren't able to do anything. And Nazari isn't able to make a difference on this game either. And it's just a game of attackers not being clinical, attackers not being able to get in the game. And you end with a 0-0 tie that I think both teams are probably okay with. Croatia, on the run of play, you know, probably deserved to win this game, but I don't think, you know, they didn't even generate over a expected goal. So it's really neither team can be mad, you know? <laughs> But full teams get the points, you share the points, and you're looking ahead at Belgium and Canada. And I think Morocco and Croatia should be a little bit worried. Uh, Luka Modric came out, 
after the game saying that you know Croatia need to have more of a killer instinct. Croatia will definitely be ready to bounce back against Canada. Meanwhile, Belgium beat Canada one to nothing, while Canada just kind of dominated this game from a run of play perspective. Obviously, Belgium still had a great game. Uh, the Beshwai goal against the run of play for Belgium is the difference maker, and it, honestly, that clinical striker is the difference here. Belgium, I think it's fascinating the way that coming into the second half, Belgium made a clear directive from Roberto Martinez to you know, slow the game down, back off the ball, don't pressure Canada at all. And I think that did a couple of things. One, Canada wants to hit you on the counter with the speed from Alfonso Davies, with the speed from Richie Lorea, from this, with the speed from Tejan Buchanan and Jonathan David. They want to hit you on the counter. So you're backing off, you're compressing your formation, and you're making it harder for Canada to really use their speed to get in between the lines. I think it was a brilliant tactical adjust- adjustment from Belgium, and they really had an off game here. They're saved by Thibaut Courtois being one of the best goalies, if not the best goalie in the world, saving an Alfonso Davies pen. And it, he had a great game from Toby Alderweireld as well. And even though Canada had, you know, Castanier, Carrasco, Witzel, Tielemans running up and down the field, they weren't able to convert. And, you know, it's a tale of Canada has nothing to be sorry for. They took you know, the FIFA number two ranked team in the world. One of the favorites to win this tournament perennially with this golden generation. Their first, Canada's first time in the World Cup since 1984. And they had a fantastic showing. They don't score a goal, but it's a lot to stand up tall for. It's a lot to, you know, acknowledge that you belong in this tournament. And we kind of said before, this is a tough group for Canada, given their position, given, you know, how well they played the past few years. But being kind of a latecomer into the stage, they have that low FIFA ranking that isn't really indicative to what this team is and honestly to how good of a coaching job Jonathan Herdman has done throughout CONCACAF and especially in this game here. So let's talk about that penalty because that penalty really is the reason this game ends one nothing for Belgium. So Canada get a penalty and it's early. They have... They've had a lot of possession. They've had a lot of pressure on Belgium. Alfonso Davies is taken down in the box in the 11th minute, but Alfonso Davies steps up to take this penalty, and it's a relatively weak penalty. Alfonso Davies has never scored a goal in an, a penalty goal in a penalty, has never converted on a penalty shot. That's that's a better way to put it. That in international competition. Meanwhile, Jonathan David has two penalties converted in league on this year. He is. Third in goals plus assists per 90. He's fifth in goals in Ligue 1 this year. And I don't know how you don't have Jonathan David taking those pens. It's what he's there for. He's one of the best strikers in the world. And Alfonso Davies, for as much as I love Alfonso Davies, he cannot be taking that penalty kick. If I was Canadian right now, I'd be screaming about that. But it really kind of puts a damper on the game because if they score there if Canada scores in the 11th minute now all of a sudden Belgium can't come into the second half you know backing off the pace as much as they do and this game has to open up a little bit more in Canada for as dominant as they were throughout this game I think that changes that changes the dynamic and they're able to exploit that a little bit more so ball possession wise I think this is fun Belgium a team that loves to possess the ball only had 54 percent of possession to Canada's 46 expected goals wise Belgium had 0.77 expected goals to Canada's 2.63. Take out that missed pen and it's still 1.9, 1.89 expected goals. So still, even without that pen, Canada dominated the big chance. They have three big chances here to Belgium's one. The difference being that Belgium are able to convert on that big chance. And that's, you know, how we leave the game. You look at a Belgian team without Romalu Lukaku you enter thinking, all right, they probably don't have the striking power that they do with them, but that's why it's been fantastic. That goal that he scores comes against the run of play. He has a defender draped around him. He's able to convert on it, and that's the difference of this game. That's what makes good teams great. In Canada, we're just missing that killer instinct here. Not to say that it won't come. The game against Croatia is going to be a major, a major measuring stick, especially with 
them being upset with their play today, Luka Modric specifically calling it out. That being said, Alfonso Davies is showing that he's one of the best players in the world coming off of injury, another game back into fitness. I think Canada had the opportunity to get three points and move into a strong position to get out of this group. But those are the games for today, tomorrow, Thanksgiving Day. I should have a video out. I think I have enough time between my family events to, to get a quick vid out after the final game. If not, I'll put a community post letting you all know. Uh, but expect a video from me tomorrow. We also have some, some things to talk about, and this will probably be a Friday video, but Women's Champions League happens today and tomorrow. PSG and it's looking like PSG and Chelsea playing on the final match day of the Champions League is going to be fireworks and kind of the major deciding factor of this entire tournament going into the knockout rounds. So a lot to talk about there. SDL City making some moves. We can talk about NWSL free agency going forward. I'll probably have a bigger podcast next week, you know, rounding up some of these topics, just given the holidays and travel and everything. But until then, Thank you all so much for sticking around. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see that long list of potential topics I just uh, went on a diatribe about. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video. And as always, folks, we will talk real, real soon. 4 a.m. wake up time tomorrow. So.